first large group session, outside in, inside out. Uh, the, the people that are joining us for this circle, please uh, introduce yourselves. Tara, Chantal, please come up. All right, welcome back, everybody. So this section um, was a section that actually, as we talked at lunch, uh, a few people in the group had, oh, I'm so sorry, I'm Maria Tania, by the way. Um, uh, a few people in the group had a little apprehension um, about uh, talking about this, because this is a group of people who are not from Miami. Um, but um, in reflecting what was talked about uh, in the morning and how uh, we heard that uh, Miami wants a mirror, Right. Uh, we hope that this uh, session serves as that. Um, so this first uh, section uh, of this uh, talk is going to really just focus on what the group here um, in the inner circle um, heard um, from the previous sessions. Yeah. Um, so if anybody wants to begin and just talk about what it was that you heard, but actually, just kidding, uh, let me backtrack. And can we first just to kind of get a little perspective and see where everybody is from? So if you could, I'll start on this side just because, I'm sorry, did you think I was going to go to the right? Yeah. <laughs> so um, if you could just uh, say your name and also just what region you're from as well. Um, and maybe even just uh, uh, what it is that you, I guess, uh, do in theater. Yeah. But keep it brief. Yeah. 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 45 seconds. <laughs> Uh, Anthony Rodriguez, co-founder, producing, artistic director of the Aurora Theater, which is in Lawrenceville, Georgia, about uh, 25 miles uh, northeast of Atlanta. We uh, are located in the most diverse county in the southeast. Hi, my name is Tara Houston, and I'm a scenic designer and scenic design professor. Um, I'm currently in Baton Rouge, well I'm not, I currently work in Baton Rouge, um, and I teach at Louisiana State University, as well as um, a freelance artist kind of all over the place. It's doing this cool thing. All right. Hi, my name is Rose Cano. I am co-founder and artistic director of Ese Teatro in Seattle. Um, we are coming up on our 10-year university. I originally trained as an actor at, at Cornish and then moved on to production. And I'm also a playwright and a director and originally from Peru um, and then spent most of my life in Seattle. So I feel like a lot of my art reflects um, my training also in South America. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Chantal Rodriguez. Um, I am the Associate Dean at the Yale School of Drama. I've been there for three years now, um, prior to uh, being in New Haven. Um, I was born and raised in Los Angeles, and I was a producer uh, and professor out there. Um, so my own scholarship is rooted in uh, US Latinx theater. Um, and as the Associate Dean, I oversee student life, but I also teach in the dramaturgy and dramatic criticism program there. Um, hi, I'm Jose Ortiz. I'm from Puerto Rico. Uh, I'm an actor, director, producer, cultural manager. I am the artistic director of Latinx Performance Ensemble. That is a new uh, theater uh, organization that we created this year. But also, I'm the community programs manager at the Theater Offensive in Boston, who is a queer theater company with 30 years of experience. Um, right, that's it. Um, hi, I'm Olga Sanchez. I'm currently based in the Northwest, originally from New York. Um, I'm actor, director, writer, teacher, uh, formerly artistic director of Milagro Theater in Portland, Oregon, and Seattle Teatro Latino in Seattle. And um, now I'm artistic director emerita for Por um, Milagro, and I'm uh, working on a PhD, focusing on Latinx theater. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so just to reiterate the question now, just what is it that you all heard um, voiced by the group in the previous uh, sessions? If anybody would like to begin. <laughs> sure, just to get started. Um, there was a lot of things, and it's a really an honor to sit here and listen, and I, and I thank everybody for their 
candor. Um, and so just to reflect back, a couple of things I heard, um, uh, um, and I don't, I don't mean to start with a, okay, I'm gonna start with a, a positive, the opportunity to perform in um, many different ways. I'm just um, I heard in terms of challenges, uh, the necessity of create like more community uh, um, and it's specifically between the, the, uh, the relationship between the English uh, speaking Latinx people and the Spanish speaking uh, Latinx uh, performers or performances. Um, I, I really um, connected with the challenges of traffic coming from Los Angeles or being raised in Los Angeles, and it is one of the things, I mean, I think um, just reflecting back the real access issues, right? And the traffic is one of those things, but um, w some folks also started talking about larger access questions in terms of the physical space and the journey some folks have to take. That journey is going to be different for an elderly person, for a person in a wheelchair, for somebody with a young child. And so um, I really appreciated the, the honest discussion about just the literal physical challenges of getting to uh, the spaces around here. Um, also, I did a little, ditto what Olga said. It, it is an honor to be invited into your community. And thank you for um, just letting us kind of permeate in the space. And I feel like we're here to be sort of a sounding board, a reflection. And I'm glad Miami likes a mirror. <laughs> I think we all like to see ourselves reflected, be it on stage, off, or in the national conversation. Um, a couple of things to, that stood out to me. Um, uh, one was the quote that uh, about, there seems to be an interest to look at um, the um, internal racism in Miami and someone had commented about believing we're above it or woke because we interject Spanish in our plays. So I thought that was a, a really courageous and kind of self um, reflective question that I thought was interesting I think shared with a lot of a lot of different cities in the US um, and creates an amazing opportunity for conversation and another point that kind of uh, resonated with me as a, a Seattle person for a lot of years is students um, questioning once they've already you know finished their training and spent you know forty thousand dollars and their tuition, do I move? Do I go to grad school? Where's a place to pa practice my artistry? So that was another thing that I, that I heard that I can really relate to um, being in Seattle and seeing students move away. So, um, <laughs> right? the cheapest kind of comedy. Uh, uh, also being in a southern city, I think that sense of, of access and public transit really resonated for me. And also that sense of talent drain, that our talent kind of has to leave to be successful. But what I found really amazing and resonant is how many folks are coming back mm -hmm. to Miami that have taken what they have learned and what they've experienced in other places and they brought it home to make change. And I find that really inspiring and powerful. From several of the panelists, uh, I, I, what resonated with me was this, is this yearning for um, a theatrical identity for Miami that seems to be lacking and that there's, there's significant divides between much of the, of the theatrical community. Um, I was, however, super inspired um, by the fact that, that here you can just, there's no need to apologize for who you are or what you do. You can just create the work in that space. And so that was, uh, that seemed like a, a great opportunity for everyone here. Uh, along those lines, one of the things that I heard was a desire um, not only to create um, something of a, of, a, of a Miami identity in terms of theater making, but also a sense of unity. The, I don't know if part of it is the geographic, the being spread out, the traffic. There's ways in which the community is, um, and, and finances is another thing, like the inability to be able to buy tickets to go see a friend's show. Um, just these various barriers that keep people from unifying. And so I felt 
this um, desire um, from multiple voices to find find unity among the community of, of Latinx, in particular theater makers. I have two things here, the necessity to find a better financial structure of production, and also the importance to tap your local government representative looking for sponsorship support. Um, I was really interested in this sense of kind of building infrastructure to support um, work in this area, that there's um, kind of a young, hungry group that's like, let's build our own thing and kind of create work. Um, and, and I think it's interesting that there feels almost like a, a bit of a divide, which Tony spoke to you, a divide between young, scrappy companies and kind of more established companies. And I'd be interested in some conversations about, you know, could there be some mentorship? Could there be connections um, and community to help create infrastructure in those younger companies and create kind of vibrancy in the in the more established companies? Uh, just quickly, I also heard about the growth in the Afro-Latinx community and how um, it's a it's a community that that wants more representation and is hungry for more representation within this larger theater making project that is in Miami. Um, I was going to say something else, but now that you brought that up, um, another thing that I heard was that there was um, um, I don't know if an incident, but there was a blackface performance that suddenly pr put the um, Afro-Latino community, I don't want to say the, these, so the many, the many myriad, in the spotlight. Um, and I see that as an amazing also opportunity to converge and, and talk about it. Um, the other thing I heard a lot was the word silo. I heard that I think six or seven times. And uh, the real desire and need to reach out to other organizations, communities, kind of the, the the need to kind of do this, sit around in a circle. So that was exciting that as you were saying it, you were doing it. Um, I also just uh, reflecting on this session, I mean, this convening happening here and knowing that TCG was just here, I wasn't there, but just even hearing in the conversations around this weekend um, that there is this renewed sort of spotlight on Miami right now, in particular looking at Miami as a model for the future in terms of the demographics is like, this is the way the country is going, right? So this, the kinds of issues that are happening here in the theater and the solutions, the creative solutions that are being discovered here um, are going to be major lessons that the American theater is, it's imperative that they begin to implement as the demographics in our country continue to change. Yeah, and to piggyback on that, I mean, w you know, we heard many of the same things that we all seem to suffer with, which is a lack of funding, uh, access, transportation, all those sorts of issues. But at the same, at the same point, the TCG being down here, I think there was another conference down here recently as well. Um, it just feels like Miami's on a, on on this tipping point, right? So, so, but which way do we go, right? What's what's going to happen? What are the things that are going to to help continue to raise the bar for that attention and and that standard? Um, you know, you you may love or hate the uh, what what the Amparo experience has sort of done to highlight certain things, but it has highlighted certain things and I think that's uh, brought attention to the work that the artists here in Miami are doing and that's I, I think a good thing. Um, picking backing on what Tara said about um, or maybe Rose about uh, Rose both of you about um, uh, the sort of the, this generation this younger generation that decides to to leave looking for other places to work outside and a real concern within this circle um, for how do we provide, how do we provide opportunities and more training? And you know, they get it. They seem to get it in the in the earlier parts of their education, and then they get to a point where they're sort of they've grown, they've aged out of training that's accessible, that's there for them, that that, that are opportunities. And there's a real concern. I heard a concern from multiple voices for how do we how do we keep engaging those minds, that talent, that that interest in theater. Um, in an active way. Um, I heard also around the importance to make m more visible the theater community uh, here in Miami in order to get opportunities, uh, the lack of awards, of recognition around their work, and, uh, and 
on the proposal of creation of a Latinx award ceremony uh, that could be locally or and also national. I think you mentioned too, just a lot of um, ATA is here this year as well. So, I mean, there's, I think everything is happening in Miami this year. Florida. Florida. Orlando, but I mean, Florida. I mean, everything Florida. is kind of on this side and south, right? Um, uh, just a tension with economics um, and a struggle for audience. The question of like, who is the audience? Who are the audiences? Um, um, how do we engage audiences who would rather spend money for soccer, or stay home, watch telenovelas. Um, so, the, so the tension for building audience, where's the audience found, um, who is the audience, who are the audiences, the multiple audiences. Mm -hmm. uh, another thing I wanted to delve more into with you guys is I heard a lot of the use of language. and. Um, um, the rich history of Spanish-speaking theater was talked about here, and also the myriad of accents and the use of accents. Accented, um, well, what I call brown tongue. So do you, accented tongue, not, not um, what was it Carmencita Pelaez that said of, of an accent, but my mind doesn't have an accent. So just kind of playing with all the different levels of language, the Spanglish, the um, which actors in which roles, um, are cast with which accents, and there also was um, uh, people who said that they felt they they had to really speak perfect English in order to enter into another world of of theater. So I just think that use of language, um, not in the literal, just English and Spanish, but all the colors, that was. Um, that for me is an interesting, exciting conversation that has influenced me as a as a playwright. Everyone's got their own brand and blend of Spanglish and how you use it for in any particular neighborhood. Um, so I thought that was a, a really a treasure chest to mine there, the accents. This is just a quick observation. Um, this is the first city I've ever been in that my white presenting self was spoken to in Spanish first. So I felt, you know, seen in a different way than has ever happened in my mixed race life. And it was both kind of intimidating because my Spanish is terrible, um, but also really kind of reaffirming that it, it created a different dialogue with myself about language um, that I'd not really ever been confronted with because the default for me has always been that folks speak to me in English. So thanks, Miami. <laughs> <laughs> um, Somewhat along those lines, I, I heard the tension, the frustration with the way that funds are distributed in this town. Um, that there's clearly, that what I heard was clearly um, a racist approach. Um, that there are certain theaters and um, uh, that speak certain languages that just simply are, are going to get more funding, more support from government agencies. I don't know about foundations, but that's what I heard in particular was the government agencies and where the funding goes. And um, so I heard that loud and clear. Well, related to what you said before, also uh, the importance uh, they pointed the, the demographic uh, here in the area not necessarily reflect what is being produced. Um, and in terms of, of lack of opportunities of grants or, or, or fundraising, um, the um, uh, ideas on how you can find people in your own community that could be uh, donors uh, also, uh, or to get, uh, or how to get more governmental and private partnerships. Um, and I think it's, it is well worth saying that these conversations are happening everywhere. Yeah, that absolutely. predominantly white institutions are getting the majority of the funding across the United States. That you know this kind of sense of how do we reflect the demographics of our city on our stages, these are conversations that are happening everywhere, including in my institution. So if there's any comfort to be held, these are, these are struggles that are happening across the map, that are happening all over the place. Second that. 
Yeah, I mean, we uh, we have we have very similar struggles, right? Uh, talent retention is a struggle in in Atlanta as well. We have pe every you know every city somebody wants to go to New York, somebody wants to go to L.A. People want to leave where they are. Uh, but highlighting the the inspirational stories of things, the entrepreneurship that people have had here in Miami. You know, uh, talking to a young man this morning um, about taking over a, a, a furniture store in Little Haiti to create a theater. That that's that's pretty amazing. And, and epic that that was able to happen uh, anywhere, whether it's Miami or, or, or any other city in the nation, that, that putting that sort of deal together where somebody can actually stay in a retail establishment, that's not easy for developers to deal with um, or to come to the plate for. Um, so I was really inspired by that. And I think those are the stories that people need to, to really highlight and, and, and bring forward so that uh, people will come back and say, I can also do that shit. I want to echo the, the economic thing again, the notion of trying to make a living as an actor. Um, certainly in Portland, uh, or designer technician, excuse me, as a theater maker, as a theater maker, we're all doing multiple jobs to do that. Um, uh, I know my experience in Seattle was the same when I spent a bunch of years there, and so, uh, and, and that's a thing that I've heard from multiple regions, um, that that is, it's just hard to make a living as a theater maker. So before I, we transition sort of to the next um, part of this, is there anyone else that wants to, um, something that you're dying to say? Yes, absolutely. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, I also heard um, a desire to raise like the personal standard, the personal standard of, um, I'm, I'm guessing of, of uh, kind of all levels of the art, of, of the art itself, the playwriting, the directing, the acting, um, and a little bit from yesterday's conversation, there was a talk about, you know, um, the talent should be the best in the room regardless of uh, the race or the culture. So I heard that in different circles, uh, willingness to, uh, uh, desire to raise the standard. And um, the importance of to encourage the new generations because they are the future of the theater movement, definitely. Okay, so to remind everyone just how all of this works now, we're going to invite um, anybody else um, who is an outsider or somebody who is um, diaspora as well. Um, and you can join the three seats um, yeah. right there. Say again. Are we going to do what we did in here? Um, that's the part that's coming oh. up right now. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, if anybody would like to join us um, in, in this conversation in the inner circle, but again, if you want to tap somebody out um, when we begin this section, um, you can do so um, as well. Uh, but for now, if we can, um, if anybody else who's an outsider would like to join or anybody who considers themselves diaspora, you don't have to, I won't force you, but there are three empty seats. We're welcome to have you. No? Going once? <laughs> <laughs> Going yeah. twice? All right, um, so I'm gonna pose a different question as well, and it doesn't mean that you can't talk about any of the past stuff, but, um, but the, the other question that I want to bring up is uh, what was it that we didn't hear? Right? We just reflected on things that we heard, but what was it that we didn't hear? As a designer and former charge artist and scenic artist, I think too often we focus in these conversations entirely on the kind of forefront visible acting, directing, writing kind of side of what um, we see on stage and we do not have enough conversation about how we're including our technicians and designers in these processes. I think there's a lot of classism built into the work that we do and often designers and technicians are kind of seen more as craftsfolk than artists um, and we need equal footing in these conversations. We are an important part of the work that happens. What I didn't hear, I heard it from some, I didn't hear it from all. Um, I didn't hear a clear articulation of, of the theaters or the people speaking about their theaters um, knowing who their audience is. Um, and so that struck me as, as odd because that's, that certainly is a, something you should know. Right? I have two reflections that definitely are very personal for me. <laughs> Uh, one is related to the uh, recent controversy around the black uh, face uh, issue that I was hoping to hear more uh, uh, people talking about th that are here and probably what I think is that is 
part of our culture in our, on our countries that uh, there are some things that we don't talk about that, even that we know that exists. And I think that that, that that is important that I don't know if, if there's any other person here wants to address that situation or what they think, but I don't want uh, people here to exit the, the company thinking that, that there's no, that here we don't have that problem. A problem that probably we have on other uh, cities, but specifically what the thing that happened here is, uh, I think that is something that, that the company, or I was hoping that the company will address more formally. Um, and also related to the uh, LGBTQ um, uh, theater here, movement, what is happening, what is not happening, what is the necessity, all those things. Oh, I didn't hear any, anyone talking about that, and I, I expect to, to know much more. Thank you. Um, I think uh, we, in our sort of uh, me pre-meeting for this, we, we also reflected right on that, that we heard about the incident, about the blackface incident in the town hall. But uh, what I'd love to hear more about is sort of, are, is there specific anti-racist work? And what is, how is the theater addressing it? Like, what are the thing, are there trainings? Are, what, are, what happens after the town hall, right? Um, and similarly, in terms of how, do, how are the way, how are we changing the way we work, something that, we're struggling with a lot and, and implementing new modes in the conservatory is around intimacy direction, right? Is that something that Miami theaters are, are looking to? Is there a need in, in this post Me Too era? Have there been conversations about intimacy on stage or you know um, the way that we're wrestling with sexism in our industry? That's something I would love to hear uh, about specifically how it affects this community. Hi, um, I'm Melissa Martinez, I'm from New Orleans. Um, and uh, one of the things that I think about a lot when I consider like the ecosystem of theater in this country, right, has to do with like how um, it's being made by different artists of different kinds of, I guess, incomes, right? Like, and I didn't hear uh, like the specificity of the theater in this community, right? Like how much of it is DIY? How many theater companies have spaces? Where are the spaces? How many, s uh, like how, what is the audience space, right? We were talking about like how, you know, who are their audiences, but what kind of theater are they making? And how do we create an ecosystem that allows us all to flourish? Yeah, yeah I have a 600 seat proscenium, but you're doing it in the, somebody's garage. And I think your art is just as valid as mine. So how do we work together to make sure that your art come to me and my artists go to you and we are all working together. Sharing of resources. Yeah. Um, two things that I was, um, I thought I would hear, I didn't. I want, well, one in particular was about intergenerational um, relationships. So I know, I feel like there's an old guard of theater making here that's uh, somewhat established, somewhat institutional. And, um, and, and I feel like in the room, a representation from newer companies, um, uh, younger companies. And I was wondering about those tensions um, or the ways in which there isn't tension, maybe the ways in which there's support. Um, I know that uh, uh, in Portland, we have ways in which larger companies and smaller companies work together and ways in which they are they are not supportive of each other, and they and they have and there's a silo there. And then the other thing I was curious about that I didn't hear mentioned, um, and frankly I don't know enough about Florida or Miami, but um, uh, the the notion of of, of an indigeneity, and what does what what does that mean, and how is that how is that a a theme or a concern in the theater that we make? So my comment's going to go kind of to to Olga's first thought, which is about kind of inter intergenerational relationships. And, and I have a real curiosity and a real hunger for more apprenticeship, internship, kind of intergenerational training that I think used to be such a core of the work that we do in theater, but the economy of working in theater has kind of separated that sense of master, journeyman, apprentice, and how we kind of move through um, our work in a, in a kind of uh, you know, sharing sort of way rather than always being um, capitalist and kind of, you know, finance based. How do we trade skills and knowledge in the same way that we think about exchanging paychecks? Uh, 
Um, a couple of thoughts. One about this um, old guard, new guard. Um, uh, I also didn't hear kind of uh, what is the succession plan when from established institutions to when it's time to change over turnover leadership succession, whoops, succession plan, just pu um, putting thought into that. So in, you know, in a few years, if X number of theaters, there's going to be turnover of leadership, or maybe you want to promote turnover of leadership, but just conversations about what is what is the next kind of evolution of the movement and um, because eventually, you know, people age out and have to move on. The other thing was about um, about the comment about racism in the blackface and indigeneity um, was about colorism. So what I didn't hear was kind of that word in the room and just taking stock of the shades of our skin as we go around the circle and who comes to these meetings and uh, we bring from our respective home countries and within this country our you know different colonial histories and and social pecking orders and and how does that reflect here and also i coming from um the northwest and from peru where there is a big um indigenous native presence i'm wondering how that does fit into um kind of the cosmovision of theater and uh, and into the aesthetic, and is it something I also don't know enough about Florida and the tribes here, and you know I don't know enough about that. Um, but there's a lot of countries here <laughs> that have many tribes, and so I'm just wondering what uh, what you guys think about that and all those people. A thing that I didn't hear, and I was really grateful for. Um, was a, uh, a thing that happens, I think, uh, happens for me anyway in, in Portland, Oregon, in Oregon in general, which is a policing of the name of the names that we call ourselves. So it was like Latinx, Latino, Latina, la Latin, Hispanic, Spanish. I was like, yes. And it, and it didn't feel, for me anyway, for me, I didn't feel like there was a policing around which term we're going to use and what the term specifically means. And I was just so grateful for that. But go Miami. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so hopefully this is uh, a little helpful, right? You might, have think, you might be thinking, especially if you're one of the Miami people, that is not at all what I meant But when I say that. Um, and, but this is what we're hearing, right? So this is hopefully just uh, uh, you guys sort of just getting what it is that we um, understood, I suppose, from, um, from the previous conversations. So we've talked about what we heard. We talked about what we didn't hear. Um, and I think some of the things that um, would be helpful now is what, um, what opportunities did we hear that perhaps people don't see as an opportunity, right? This has been a conversation that has sort of come up a little bit um, during the, the um, actually yesterday a little bit as well. Uh, but what is it that you see that you're thinking, you know, this is a really great opportunity? Um, I think in hearing about how much work is being done here, and even even when folks are like, you know, there's tribalism and we're all over the place. For me, it was uh, I saw an opportunity um, for perhaps a regional alliance, right? So like either throughout Florida, throughout Miami, uh, probably throughout uh, a smaller group right here in Miami or the the region uh, specifically to have an alliance. So there are alliances that were created uh, in Los Angeles and Chicago and New York and 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 some and they're successful um, because the people are committed and, and some of them sort of ebb and flow but um, it was just an idea that I thought oh I wonder if there is a regional alliance and if not is there energy and desire to have a regional alliance um, that is not about paying dues it's just about it's volunteer it's like the commons but on a regional scale Hi, I'm Tanya Perez from New York. Um, I am always solution-based, so one of the things that popped out to me was when there was a mention of um, location, and specifically parking and traffic, because I know that happens both in New York and Los Angeles, um, and that's always an issue. And it, for me, it was like, oh, that's, that's an opportunity for somebody to come in and um, maybe partnering a couple of theaters to say, how do we get something like Uber or Lyft um, to think really big picture um, with the with 
collaborations with these theaters and also something that is very specific to a problem and um, elevating how you uh, create an, another conversation. Um, there was also the one where it was saying in your playbills uh, that you, um, you gave a shout out to other um, other theaters and what the plays are, which I've, um, I've actually seen in Atlanta, which I thought was really exciting because I was like, oh, um, sometimes not even New York does that. Um, but it's, it's exciting to say, though you actually, there are, there are the budding of um, solutions that are brimming with all of the collaborators who are in this room. And, um, and to see that happen makes me go, I can actually take this back to um, to my silo <laughs> and say this is something that is here's the problem and here's the solution and how do we make that magic happen? Um, I, I I've been um, and impressed is the wrong word, but I've been inspired by the voices in this room. I think there's some great thinking, and I think that's an opportunity. <laughs> I mean, I just think there's some real talent. I don't know about your work, but I will say that your hearts and your minds and your clarity around your work is, is, is really powerful. It's really palpably strong, everybody. And, um, and, it's been, and it's been inspiring to think about this community and what that theater might look like. And the things that I've seen so far this weekend, I, I've just been really delighted by. Um, love the reading this afternoon. Um, uh, 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 but, and, <laughs> e, <laughs> no, um, it, se me fue, okay. Well, let me, let me um, interject a little bit here. So, um, so we've gotten a lot of sort of uh, the outside perspective a little bit, but, uh, Let's open this up also to Miami people as well. If you want to respond to any of this, you can. Um, if you want to just reflect a little bit more, you can. Um, also, we're, we're sort of, if you don't want to come up to the circle, that's all right. But if you feel like you have something to say that you want us to think about, this is actually going to be really useful for tomorrow's um, uh, uh, conversations as well. We have these um, pieces of paper all throughout. Um, and Abigail... Um, is going, well, yeah, I think she's got the stickies, yeah. Um, she's got these little stickies, and if you would um, want to write something down, um, you could write it down and come up and talk, um, or you could just write something down and just kind of stick it on one of these, um, and these will be sort of points of um, conversation. Um, Armando's also going um, around with uh, those. So if there's anything that you're thinking, hey, this needs to be talked about tomorrow, or this is a conversation that needs to continue in whatever way, um, feel free to uh, put those on there as well, but also feel free to join us, yeah? Okay, so I remember what it was. Oh, good. Um, uh, so, uh, somebody mentioned the idea, and I, and I agree with this, and I had the same feeling in Portland doing Latinx theater at Milagro, which was there's the, the thing that we're doing there is an experiment and a potential model as the rest of this country gets more and more diverse, as more and more la Latinos um, fill this country. Um, yes, and, and, and that there's something really important about this theater that we're making that is inevitably going to represent, in all its complexity, the, the demographics and the audience that is emerging in this country. And I share the same feeling as you do, Tara, of, of somewhat, I think, of walking into, in, landing in Miami and just feeling like, ah, oh, like there was something about that, that that I just felt at home. And I have not lived here. I've been here a couple times. I've never lived here. And, but just for whatever reason, it felt it felt like home, and I feel like there's there's marketing to be done. There's, <laughs> in other words, there's a way in which there was there was talk about how do we how do you, how does that unified Miami Latinx theater scene become something that draws people from around the country to come here to see your theater in all of its in the whole ecology. I wanted to speak to that if I could. Um, about 26 years ago, uh, I arrived here to teach at FIU, and I had that same experience. I, as someone who was Puerto Rican but never lived anywhere where a lot of Puerto Ricans were, I arrived here and literally in the airport and went, I'm home. Um, I'm curious how unique that is because I imagine there is a similar but different experience 
I, I myself don't speak Spanish very well, but I love going to the store and having pe people speak to me in Spanish. It's, it's, it's just, I, I've never heard anybody else express it. And I, I love getting my hair cut in Spanish. <laughs> yeah. But I'm wondering if, 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 if in El Paso or, or San Antonio, where there's a, I mean, we have what, 70, 80% Hispanic. Uh, And I'm wondering if, if there are other, if any of you all had that experience um, in, 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 in other cities where, or are we a unique city for Latinx folks to come visit? Just quickly. Just quickly, I think part of it is the internationalness, the diversity of, of nations represented, cultures represented here in Miami. Yeah, part of it. <laughs> they, they picked the right uh, name for this university, I guess, then. Um, but I think to backpack on that a little, er, um, I think that because of the situation that they are, that you are in, in Miami, and you have all of this, these companies and all these resources, I think we need to consider and always be functioning in the long term, like um, I guess plan for the entirety that is our medium, right? And so you need to be empowered by the fact that you have this. I mean, yes, there's a lot of things that we want to be better. There's always going to be that, right? But you are like yes we want people to come here and be inspired and you know like have people from all over the country come here and be like this is the hub for latin theater but also like i want to come here and be empowered by you so that i can bring that back to my community because you're not the only one that has latinos but we're scared because we don't think that there's enough of us and so we aren't going to make the theater companies in michigan or you know illinois or wherever yeah, and Louisiana, right? There's a huge Latin community in Louisiana after Katrina. They came to rebuild, and they aren't working in the arts. They aren't doing any of those things, but we have the power to give that to them and create that atmosphere for them, but we need models with which to like be inspired. Um, so I have an, uh, my name is Dylan Nilo, I guess, by the way. Um, I have an idea of an opportunity, and we're doing it right now. We're live streaming all these things right now. How around they live stream shows, they live stream events. The Latinx Theater Commons is a like a subset of How Round. So like that, like when we talk about accessibility and like how do we get more audiences, how do we get people to see and witness theater, we're doing it. We have this resource. And so I think the ba like not only Miami um, but like everybody else around the world can use that. And also um, we have the world theater map. Um, which for if any of you who do not know what the World Theater Map is, it's also a project of HowlRound. Um, and it's um, essentially like a Wikipedia slash Facebook for theater makers worldwide. You can edit it like a wiki article. Like you can add shows, you can add theater companies, you can add theater makers from around the world and that's how you can connect as well. And something that I've had success with in my classroom is bringing in voices through Skype. So my students often feel really isolated in Louisiana. We don't have a lot of professional theater. Um, so thinking about who you already have in your network that you can bring as a voice, you know, it costs nothing to spend half an hour on Skype with someone. So how can we bring in voices that maybe we feel like we don't have in our community so that folks are, are being exposed to kind of theater in other places, artists in other places? Yeah, and just to add to that, the, uh, yeah, the, Lat the Latinx Theater Commons is truly a, a circle resource. It's meant to include everyone and our meetings. You can talk to Armando Wipe, our new producer, but there are um, uh, meetings that are open and they're held by telephone and there are people from coast to coast and beyond, um, all coming from a horizontal, there's no head, it's all everyone's on the same playing field to be able to exchange ideas it's a giant brain trust because you want you know you want to be able to put your ideas in the center and feel reflected and being able to bounce them off other people without being judged so i found it to be um i feel like it helped m uh, me feel and say to seattle we are part of latin america and this and this latino theater producing scene uh, I think that uh, the other two cities that probably uh, we said that is more or less like Miami are 
Los Angeles and New York. I personally uh, more related with the New York theater, Latinx theater scene, and it's not perfect. <laughs> but I think that could be a, a mirror uh, that Miami theater makers could see and reflect and, and take the good things that the, my, the Latinx theater community in New York have. Uh, it would be very interesting also to see more um, um, movement between uh, here and there. Uh, most of the time, and my experience is that, that people from here would like to go to New York, but there's, there's no opportunity from people from New York to come here to perform also. And that exchange, it's, it's, it's important that, that, that we can create uh, that, uh, that uh, way. Uh, and uh, what I hope uh, after we exit this convening tomorrow is that all of us, uh, people that live here and the ones that are not living here, but we all know people here that probably we were expecting to be here uh, that are not. So it's important that, that we all uh, 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 turn into spokesperson and let them know what happened here and what are well, all the issues that we discuss and, uh, and, 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 and how can they be part of the, of the solution. I think that this is very important. I think I'll say a couple of things first. Um, I, I think I am a, I'm a little disappointed in the mo at the moment about um, how many folks we lost uh, from the earlier sessions to the sessions. I feel like there's a potential for conversation here that, um, that left with them. Uh, I think that, and obviously they're very busy. There are folks who are heading to shows and opening their shows and, and going back to their theaters to get their work done. Um, but I also wanted to bring up um, uh, this conversation that I've been having with Edgar over and over again this week uh, in preparation for this weekend about um, kind of like the legal differences between like how much Spanish language theater happens here because Spanish language theater is outside of the jurisdiction of equity and so it's outside of the unions and they don't, um, they don't, police. it's kind of like the wild west of contracting um, and so which we all know right and so um, I think uh, because of the particularity of, of what my, of uh, the demographics of Miami, and um, we we keep saying this, it's the country is heading in this direction. It's really the vanguard, and so there aren't solutions out there that we can like bring over here, right? That like this is going to be the lab, like Chantal was saying, that um, where we could discover things that that we because of of, of what it is. And I'm really excited by that potential, and I also recognize like the incredible challenge that it must be. Yeah, no I'd like pressure, to hear from Miami. Miami folks. Yeah, no pressure, <laughs> Miami, none. <laughs> uh, <coughs> Thank you, for the brilliance of the inside group. Thank you, guys, and the candidness. Um, I don't. I wouldn't be able to sleep if I didn't say this. I've been close to all most of the issues that we've talked about. You know, the issue with the blackface, I've, I've seen it and I've tried to combat it. The issue with the queer uh, underrepresentation, I've seen it and I've tried to combat it. There's a lot of fear. Uh, there, there's a, a large base of um, um, folks that are very afraid of the new things uh, some people m make excuses and say, well, it's a cultural transition that I always mention that word because it's true that, that in uh, where people come from, um, there are a lot of um, uh, groups that prohibit or, or um, um, you know, do not allow certain um, things to be portrayed on stage. And, and that is just a poor excuse. I mean, we need to be fearless in Miami in around the country for example, one of the things that I always say, if you have a character that needs a, a, you know, an Afro-Latino folk, a friend uh, to, 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 to you know, one of ours, we're the same, go find that person. Mm -hmm. The rule is you don't represent somebody with someone else because our community is so diverse. You know, try to get specific. 
the fear here is punishment, you know? But we have to face that punishment to get the rewards. So for myself, I don't care about, puni you know, whatever happens because I've been so outspoken this past year. And I encourage all of you to also do that wherever you are from. So the conversations we can have, like I've had with Armando and, you know, every, you know, whoever I've tried to touch uh, very close about this uh, observation that I've, I've intensely ha uh, been uh, having in Miami. Um, so I welcome, you know, any conversation you want to have about all these issues in more depth. <coughs> so, um, yeah, but fearlessness, do not be afraid. You have to take those chances. Even if you lose audiences, even if, if you lose funding, even if they tell you, my community is religious based, so I will not support you, you find other people. And this I tell you, because it was the last show that I did, completely sold out, every single ticket. After there were people who said, mm, we won't support this, in Facebook, tagging you, saying things, you know, why did you m make a, a genderless lead character the character that was the traditional salsa guy? Who cares? Be fearless. Thank you. Before, um, just uh, I'm, I'm uh. loving that I'm seeing the, the stickers go up. I want you guys to think about a few things. Um, any solutions to challenges? Um, any additional resources that, um, so I just want to make sure we mention this stuff as well. Um, and also something, um, just that what priorities you think, as Miami um, folk, uh, you think should be addressed, right? What are the, the priorities you think need to be talked about um, just in the next couple, in, in this time and in tomorrow? So if you haven't written anything down, please feel free to, um, to do that. A couple of, of opportunities. Uh, one of the things that I wanted to incorporate into this weekend was uh, an undoing racism workshop. Um, and it, it, um, it was really hard for me to let that go uh, because it's something that uh, we needs to be done here and there is a, um, a want for that, but we needed to start first where first with other com other questions. So um, so to address that, that is um, something that we have spoken um, in, in previous conversations uh, c leading up to this. Um, and definitely that's something that, that we want to do, but for this weekend it would have been too, it's just too short, too, too short of a time. Um, another thing is um, Andy, Andy uh, Arthur, who, who is um, with the South Florida Theater League, I also invited her, and she supported us by spreading the word about the Latinx Theater Commons. So that was um, so that was really wonderful. But there is an opportunity to to form uh, some some sort of alliance, and that's something that has been on my mind. <laughs> um, and as far as intimacy, uh, I think that is a really really great great question. I think that's something that really needs to be introduced here uh, because. I feel, I don't know if, if, Wayne, if you feel this way, but I, I feel like there's not a lot of blocking for certain things that's kind of like in the moment. And that, yeah, and so that's, that's something that is really important here. Thank uh, you for addressing those directly. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I jumped back in because of, of what Edgar mentioned about casting and casting specifically. And I feel, I just wanted to shout out that that's a blessing that the ability to do that, the ability to be specific and accurate um, here is something that I don't have in Portland, Oregon. And I know we don't have it in Seattle either. There's a lot of communities that are trying to do Latinx theater and we cast as best as we can, as often as we can, Latino actors, and sometimes we can't. But we wanna do this work, we wanna do this theater, we wanna do this play. We want to represent stories, and we do it the best we can. That you have a wealth of talent here, um, in all capacities, in, in all the venues, is a is a is a blessing. It's complex. It makes things harder. It's a blessing. Um, 
Um, but also, to your point, Adriana, about the kind of workshops and, and thinking about anti-racism and thinking about um, uh, in, uh, intimacy and thinking about ways in which we do the work better and we do the work consciously. And I think th that's an opportunity, yes, the training, but it's an opportunity to, it's part of that making the work stronger. Not just the work itself, but the way in which we do the work. And I think there's an opportunity here with these things that you're, you're suggesting um, uh, to not only do the work better, not only do the, not only do better work, but do the work better, I guess, yeah. Just to let you know, there is a specialist in intimacy who teaches at the University of Miami. Um, so you might want to contact her. Um, and uh, those of you who are going to ATHA, we are addressing that in the pre-conference for acting and directing. So, And there's also the specialist that's coming in from Canada. Yeah, um, uh, this show I just last directed, uh, it shows how good intentions don't necessarily pay off. Mm. Uh, I had a scene in which there was some physical contact in a way that might be considered something that, w that uh, an intimacy coach might be valuable for. But being an old guy who's been doing this for a long time, it never occurred to me. There were students who I know were very good friends and they were, uh, much of the stuff they came up with that was problematic, they came up with on their own. And luckily I had a faculty member who said, no, we probably need to talk about this and, sp and spend some time with these students. So it's a, it's a bit of a learning curve on that for some of us. But I think it's great, and I think it's so logical. We have fight choreographers, why not? And it seems to be happening in film as well. Um, at least it, it, it's starting to. The other thing I want to address is completely unrelated. Um, Adri, how, how, how much does it cost to fly down from New York? Under a couple hundred bucks? Oh, wow, that sucks. I was going to... I was going to suggest that, that what I see in this conference, this, this convening this weekend, um, is a lot of people who spend some time in New York and spend a lot of time in Miami, or spend a lot of time in Miami, spend some time in New York. Vicky just moved down here. Uh, Michael's going to come here in January with, with Ashley for his play. You travel all the time. So at least among our, our alumni, I know there are people who, uh, who travel up to, uh, I, uh, one of my friends, Jimmy Puig, lives here in Miami but goes up to New York to work and audition. It's, it's a connection that we might have that is a little more convenient than Los Angeles or other places. Um, I was hoping it was still as cheap as it was years ago. Uh, it used to be like 100 bucks to, to fly, but not so much. Uh, nevertheless, I think that's, d at least geographically, it's something that we can, we can uh, work with each other uh, in a way that uh, we have a lot in common as well. You can fly to local places that are cheaper. Oh, so I fly into Daytona or Orlando because my family's based there, but it is, you know, even though it's a drive, it's a lot closer than trying to drive from well, New York City. Too, so yeah, yeah, so it is possible. And I think that, that for me is, you know, my curiosity, I used to early in my career live in New York and then get flown down to do all the shows regionally in Florida. Um, and um, and I, I mean, I love working in Florida, so it's something that I think um, my question, and I, maybe it's also you know, the opportunity, is saying how do you make those um, connection relationships from New York to, to down here because there's such a beautiful wealth of theater here, um, even stronger. Um, and also it, um, it brings in, for me, the curiosity of what the leadership and how to do the outreach with our, you know, sister cities. This, this is just a small portion of the solution to the problem, but we have a, 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 a be, we're here at FIU and, and we have a, a real strong network of, of uh, alumni and, and, and much of the, the people I was just talking about are just a few of the people that are Miami people that are, that are in, and then through them we meet other, other folks who come down here. So I think that maybe working off uh, uh, networking that already exists might be a good place to start. I really loved uh, the, I think it was, I'm, n I'm not sure who brought it up, maybe Olga, the intergenerational col uh, collaborations that can happen. In New York, for example, 
uh, with Rosalba, uh, the Soul Project partnered up with her, and now we're doing this this reading series in the summers, and and it's really it's been a wonderful collaboration. Uh, they, uh, the Puerto Rican Traveling Theater in Pregones has their their audience, right? That are that are passionate uh, followers. And then the Soul Project has a, a, a different crowd. And then to see both crowds together is amazing. Uh, and so we just we just uh, had our, our second year of Soul Fest. So something like that would be really great here where you are learning from each other. You're learning, uh, you have that exchange. So I really love that idea as an opportunity. Talking about around that, not also them, or Teatro Sea, uh, have a, a here in Florida uh, also produce uh, from New York, I and mean they are they produce mostly a theater for children, and um, Hispanic Federation that is producing uh, Fuerza Fest uh, for the fourth year now, an LGBTQ uh, festival. Uh, they are doing also things here in Florida, uh, and they have a lot of money and resources. So things are outside. If so we have only a few minutes left. I don't know if anybody else has something that just is burning that they want um, to share with the group, whether it's about solutions to the challenges that were posed, uh, things that we heard in the initial group, um, or if there's any um, additional um, resources that people are thinking about, but I love everything that we heard. Um, and the truth is that um, as we were reflecting in our uh, meeting at lunch, it seemed like there was a lot of um, things that resonated with us because uh, really, uh, Miami, we see you and we hear you and you really are not alone. There's quite a bit of this stuff that goes on um, just around the country. Um, and, and I was actually really surprised, um, shocked really, uh, that people have, uh, that there wasn't actually even more Latinx theater um, in Miami, like even more. So I just thought it would be like the only thing almost <laughs> like here, as opposed to, I mean, I'm, you know, I'm being naive, but, but because I just moved to, um, to the Seattle area and I just had to cast Luis Alfaro's Mojada, which is the Mexican version of Medea with a Japanese lady. Yes, so, and she was actually great and spoke fabulous Spanish, right? Um, but it was just such, the, the, the resources weren't there. So when I, um, I also stepped off the airplane and was like, wow, it felt like home. And everywhere that I went in elevators, people were speaking Spanish. And I thought, wow, what an amazing resource, right? Um, and how lucky everyone in Miami um, is to have that. I still love the Pacific Northwest now, but. Um, and not the humidity, but uh, certainly there are wonderful opportunities, but we do see you and we do, um, you really are not alone. There's, there's something going on everywhere. Did you have something? Else? No, just quickly to respond. Uh, yeah, we were a little spoiled when, when I did uh, <laughs> and in the tropics here, I looked around the room and said, we are Nilo. Everyone in the cast practically had the same life experience as Nilo. We, there's nobody more qualified to do any in the tropics or any Nilo play than the people in this room. And, and that became the sort of phrase for the production is we are Nilo. Um, and I imagine trying to do that play elsewhere is sometimes problematic. <laughs> but in fact, I've done it with a whole bunch of Mexican people. So yeah, yeah, it's, it's a thing. Go ahead. Um, I just want to hit on the conversation in terms of reaching like the younger generation. Um, I really wanted to, us to push past thinking about educational theater and outreach in regards to creating new audiences, but really thinking about engaging with young people as artists who are working to open artistic pathways for them so that they can also see themselves as artists. Um, so I just want to push us when we think about outreach, it's not just about producing a play or uh, for audiences to see, but really engaging the young people in the community as artists. Um, and as it was mentioned earlier, Miami is home to District 8, which is one of the largest student thespian festivals, and there's a lot of really eager young people in the city who are dying to do theater and create theater. So I just want us to think about our young people as artists, not just audiences, to come to see our shows. 
Um, thank you, everybody, for engaging in this conversation. I'm going to turn this over to Armando. Hi. Uh, thank you, everybody. Whoa, I feel like we're tired. Um, I'm going to, so a couple things. Um, 